Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm going to be talking about how to use analytics and big data uh, to help uh, public administrations in, in, in the usage of the pandemic. And it's great to be here, and it's great to be physically, because as you very well remember, two years ago, the situation was really, really very different. Uh, two years ago, in March 2020, when the, this uh, Mobile World Congress uh, was canceled, we were, it was the moment where COVID-19 was spreading all over the world and um, with uh, a lot of um, impacts both on, on human lives and the economy. And two years ago, governments and national local institutions were struggling, like taking decisions, very important decisions that have an impact in the way the, the, the virus was spreading out, uh, as I say, with a lot of impact in the economy. And as you all know, uh, mobile operators play a very relevant role. Uh, first, because our networks, our services were really important in, in communicating people and also from one day to the other, everybody was teleworking, uh, teleeducation, and our networks were really important. But that's not the only role that operating uh, and, and telco operators were playing, because it very, very sudden, it was very clear that mobility was a, a very important factor in taking decisions because the relationship between the mobility and the um, speed of, of the spreading of the virus. Uh, in the case of Telefonica, as it happened with other uh, operators in, in different places of the world, we started to collaborate with governments, um, always supported by GSMA, because it was very clear that our mobility patterns were very important uh, in the decisions that the governments were um, the decisions that they were making, both in terms of uh, understanding how the, the, the virus was spreading and also the impact of the different um, lockdowns uh, that they needed to, to decide. In our case, um, we collaborate with the different governments in the UK, in Germany, in Spain, in Brazil, and different countries of Hispan America. So let me tell you a little bit about what we did with, uh, with the government of Spain. What we did was to leverage a platform uh, that we were already using for our B2B customers that is called Smart Steps. And thanks to that, we were able to provide to the, our government, to the Spanish government, very um, helpful information in taking the decisions. They were receiving uh, 9 a.m. the day after what was happening in the country. Uh, and uh, that was because we were already in place this platform, as I say, it's called Smart Steps, that processes billions of events that the mobile phones of our 350 million customers uh, in, in the different countries. Uh, this information is anonymized and is aggregated and extrapolated. And with that, we could um, show how the crowds, how the population was moving from one place to the other. And that information was really helpful for the government in order to take decisions of which uh, the, the different uh, provinces or regions or even municipalities needed to lock down and what was the impact both in the spreading of the, of the virus and also on the economic recovery. And it was a very good example on how these mobility patterns and that we use, as I say, for our transportation customers, to our retail customers, to help uh, tourism, etc., was also a, a very good help for, for good. how big data for social good is something that the operators can do in collaboration with, um, with the government. What are some of the key uh, learnings from this experience? And as I see, what is important is not, Telefonica was not the only operator that did that. I know that that happened in different places, is that there are um, some important factors. The first one, the fact that our platform was ready, 
uh, help us to provide not only the information that happened from the March 2020 uh, onwards, we could also compare with historic data. So we could show what happened the same date the year before, or even comparing labor days, holiday days, etc. So to have uh, this uh, historic data storage uh, proved to be a very important element in, in, this, in this strategy. And as you can imagine, the impact of each decision that the government was making was really important for, for the country. Another factor that was also very important is that we were able to normalize the information. We were using what is called NAT, that is nomenclature of territory units, to the lowest level, so even municipality. And we could uh, show how the population was moving from one place to the other, from, from one region to the other, from one province to the other, from one municipality to the other, and even within and inside the, the municipality. So they, they could have the granularity that they needed, and that, that was a very important impact. There was a lot of commitment from our team because we need that that was really important. So we, we work every day, uh, very uh, late hours, in order to have the information at 9 a.m. the day after because we knew that what we was doing was really important for, for the country. Of course, in this kind of information, it's always very important visualization. So we work together with the municipalities to understand which kind of data they needed. As you see, it's the same way we work with, with our customers. In this case, they, they really needed to, under, to understand the uh, implications of decision in one province or in one municipality and what was the impact on the, um, on the mobility in, in the others. Uh, and, and we designed with them different, um, different uh, visualization tools um, that was um, interactive dashboards that they could use and they could adapt uh, uh, as the pandemic was, was progressing. Another thing that was interesting is that we could also, with our data, um, differentiate what was the official territories, so the way Spain is, in this case, uh, uh, divided up into, into different regions and different provinces, and to move from that um, official uh, regions to the real ones, to the ones that show how the movements among the population were moving, how the economic, for instance, impact from one place to the other was, was moving. And we took another step further, collaborating, for instance, with one of the main uh, financial institutions in Spain, and we were able to combine not only mobility, that in this case was coming from our telco data, but also with them we were sharing the um, transaction data that was coming from the credit cards and the ATM. So we could analyze the impact of each decision in the mobility patterns of the populations and in the consumption of the population. And with that, we uh, help them to estimate the impact of each of the, of the themes. We could also analyze how we were getting back to normality. So you can see, and this is just a glimpse of the kind of things that we can do uh, when we put uh, and we combine the, the resources that we have as uh, private companies uh, with, with the public institutions. What are some of the learnings and why do we think that this was a success? And the first one is very important every time that we talk about, um, about data, is that we have privacy by design. So we knew exactly which kind of data we could share um, um, following the GDPR regulation. And it was very clear from the beginning that everything that we're doing was not only legal, but also ethical. And, and that was a, an important success factor. The second one is really you need to understand the, the, that uh, the principles of the company are to be committed with the societies where we, where we work with, of course, in this critical situation, but not only during the coronavirus crisis, but also in general. So to understand uh, and to provide a purpose to the employees to, to really collaborate with the, with the societies. 
And the third one is that everything that we design in this case for our customers, we can use them also for the developing of the societies. So we were able to provide this from one day to the other because it was something that we have been investing in the past and everything was ready to support the, the society. Of course, that was a specific situation that we hope we, it will never repeat again, but there are learnings about what we can do with this kind of projects in the future. And the first one is that I think it has been clearly demonstrated the power of the telco data, how powerful it is for this kind of situation and many other situations. And in order to do so, it's important to foster public and private collaboration. And I was writing some examples of different sectors working, collaborating with the public institutions and supported in this case by GSMA. Um, to make sure that everything that we do is also uh, expanded and cooperative to us as, as best practices with other operators. And something that is really important is that we need to design something that is sustainable. So we need to evolve, and this is one learning for this kind of projects, from POCs, some proof of concepts or specific projects, to something that stays over time. And the only way that this is going to happen is if we are able to, to have something that is sustainable for, for everybody involved. And of course, it's possible to expand this kind of projects, uh, not only for reacting to pandemic. Um, and, and there are other experiences that are also supported by GSMA where we are collaborating and trying to use this kind of data, sometimes combined with IoT, with IoT devices, for instance, for uh, understanding what is happening with the climate change. So very aligned with the ODS, for, for, uh, the Sustainable Objectives. Um, there are collaboration possibilities of using mobile data together with IoT data to, to make sure that we can um, evolve in, in, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, objective. And of course, ethic is always important. We need to keep in mind that everything that we do is something that we need to, do, to develop with, with, uh, with ethics and privacy and security on mind. So I want to let you with this, with this experience of how uh, uh, operators using uh, services that we have developed for other purposes and that we are applying to, to customers uh, to be to be customers, we can also uh, use it for good. That's the practice of big data for social good uh, that we are supporting in Telefonica uh, with collaboration of the GSMA. So thank you very much, and I hope you this one. Thank you. Lena. Well, thank you very much, and um, I'd like to introduce Frederick Trauger from Nokia, um, who's going to talk about big data. Good afternoon, everyone. So how is everyone feeling? All right, it's a little bit late in the day already, so I have a question for you. Who in the room is having some variable on the body, right? I think that is connected, a smartwatch, something that collects data. Yeah, quite a few, I think I get. Who of you, I think I get, are getting served, I think, a drink because you are dehydrated, I think, automatically in the room? Anyone? <laughs> Eric, uh, that's wonderful. I think, why is it that I think you are not automatically, I think, I get served when your variable is telling you actually that you are dehydrated? I think there are a couple of reasons for that, and I will elaborate partially, I think, on the reasons. I think as an industry, we have made huge progress in connecting people and things. According to McKinsey, I think IoT will grow 45% year on year in the coming years. We can connect, but how can we exchange data? and how can we safely monetize our data? That's the question I will try to answer in the next 10 to 15 minutes. 82% of the enterprises 
consider external data, be critical for the future of their business. Most of the digital businesses that are founded are here today build, I think, their assets on the assumption that data are available are here to them. But there are four key challenges we have to overcome to really allow, I think, the industry to thrive on data. Number one, data today resides predominantly in silos that are not connected. Number two, compliance. Different countries and different regulations don't easily allow data to be shared. Third, often data exchange need to be in real time and uh, need to happen at the edge. Hence, I think the availability of, I think, uh, edge capacity is still limited. And fourth is who really owns the data and who has the right to monetize the data. These are the four key challenges. Look, we in Nokia have created, I think, a platform, a marketplace that allows by private IA blockchain to address most of the challenges of data exchange and uh, data monetization. And I will dive a little bit uh, deeper into, I think, the next stage of development and what is required. So, we have, uh, yeah, see, here we see the parts of, uh, I think, what is required in order to have today a proper, I think, IoT environment. You have the connectivity layer for devices and sensors. You have the network uh, yeah, layer that uh, yeah, connects everything. You have then the cloud, uh, yeah, either public uh, yeah, or right out to the edge. And you look at your device management and data collection layer. And on top of it sits, I think, what we call our Nokia data marketplace that really connects use cases and allows data to be shared. But the data are shared, I think, uh, yeah, not by exchanging data and moving uh, yeah, data. It's by AI and ML analytics that is running on the data. So we comply, number one, I think, with regulations, and we reduce the amount of data that are transitioning to the different uh, yeah, parts of the network. In CSP space, Nokia Data Marketplace can be, complimentary, can be a complementary offering on top of CSP private wireless uh, yeah, strategy. A research institute in Alberta is uh, yeah, providing and creating 5G use cases together with uh, yeah, five CSPs that will allow, I think, uh, yeah, data exchange and the creation of, I think, uh, yeah, use cases that can thrive on a marketplace and are being built on, I think, a data model. To bring uh, yeah, new 5G use cases uh, to life, many different players in an ecosystem need to collaborate. And data is often the vital component. Open APIs enable all players to upload uh, yeah, data streams. And NDM can deliver an end-to-end -end solution. So, how have we arrived uh, yeah, there? Look, before I deep dive into the interworking of the data marketplace, let's wind back a step. It was about five years ago, I think on a similar stage, we were announcing the launch of our IoT connectivity business wing. Right? Since then, I think we have rolled out a global network grid, a global, I think, core network. We have managed, uh, I think, uh, the connectivity very well. Just to give you a couple of examples of, I think, uh, yeah, key elements we have built, today we are connecting with AT&T cars around the world that seamlessly are connected and producing, I think, seamless uh, yeah, results, I think, wherever they are deployed. We are working with our customer, Hutchinson, in, in, uh, in Indonesia to connect up to 79 million smart meters and focus on, on, on energy saving. What we focus together with HMD, also known as Nokia mobile phones uh, yeah, these days, I think to connect up to 500,000 uh, yeah, uh, yeah, restaurants together, I think, with delivery partners. So the connectivity layer today, I think, is something I believe that is uh, yeah, well managed and well handled. But after seamless connectivity, we are now taking the next step to solve the secure data exchange. 
let's go back to the four challenges I mentioned. First, data silos. Private permission blockchain technology makes uh, you sure that data is safe and can be traced. This private uh, permission is not public blockchain, but I say specifically private blockchain, because sometimes I think there is a clear confusion between one and the other. Second, compliance. In line with country-specific regulations and legal limitations, we use federate learning. What does it mean? We run AI and ML over the data without moving the data, but the results and the learning from the IML are clearly giving the insight and, and, and producing the outcome for the use case. Third, low latency. Processing at the edge ensures data can be produced in real time because many of the use cases need low latency. And here, I think uh, yeah, we work closely with our partner AWS to make sure that uh, the edge capacity is available and tuned uh, also for those use cases. And fourth, and not the least important, data ownership. Smart contracts will allow, I think, uh, the owner of the data to sign and engage in a commercial agreement seamlessly and control the flow of data and the use of data. So, who can become a marketplace provider then? Everyone. Consortiums, CSPs, enterprises, because the marketplace in it itself is neutral to the data that are being used. It's neutral uh, yeah, to the use cases that are being provided. And I think this is the beauty, while I think uh, yeah, clearly we love to work with our customers, I think it's open to everyone. And I will provide in the next uh, year stage three use cases we are deploying today, I think, that shows clearly the variability from Number one, some maritime logistics. Number two, healthcare. And number three, some sports. That shows clearly, I think, what this marketplace can be. So, let's start with maritime logistics. We have seen, I think, I get that supply chain and maritime, I think, delivery is one of the backbones of uh, the world's logistics. And we have seen this year how painful it is when it is uh, yeah, broken. So together with uh, yeah, Marlen, a consultancy uh, from the Netherlands that is uh, yeah, focused on maritime uh, supply chain, we are working in, in, on improving with uh, Nokia Data Marketplace the flow of data through the various uh, yeah, stages. You have inbound logistics. You have the entire, I think, customs. You have uh, loading, unloading. You have uh, yeah, the vessel at uh, yeah, sea. You have uh, yeah, all the organization that participate uh, in, in, in the model. Today, this is totally fragmented. So with uh, Nokia Data Marketplace, we allow that all these parties share their data together. And if possible, I think, allow also for the monetization of data. So this means everybody involved has access seamlessly to the data, sees, I think, uh, yeah, what is uh, yeah, processing, where there is a choke point, and allows, I think, real-time uh, yeah, monitoring. Marlen, <coughs> Marlen I think, uh, yeah, uh, looks at this as, I think, one of the key elements of optimizing maritime uh, yeah, supply chain logistic and estimates today that up to 30% of productivity can be gained in the supply chain of, uh, and logistic of, I think, the maritime ecosystem. So let's move uh, yeah, forward uh, to healthcare. Blood pressure sensors, maybe here, I think, uh, on your wrist. I think glucose sensors and remote uh, yeah, telemetry has caused an exponential increase in data at the edge already. But it's data that is maybe available uh, yeah, to me only, and it's fragmented. We equally see that in many countries, healthcare sits in silos. I think part of the health is locally held by the GP. Part is held by health institutions and hospitals. And uh, yeah, part is, I think, uh, yeah, just uh, very private uh, yeah, to myself. 
There are many reasons why this is. With Nokia Data Marketplace, we are hoping by running AI and ML algorithms over distributed data sets across different locations, that data, while I think privacy and everything is, is, is clearly warranted, can be used and can be put there to use. We are partnering here with Equidium Health, earlier known also as IA Consensus Health, and together we will bring new use cases where research of data and patient data is of value. Just to give you, I think, one example that we are seeing today. Clinical, I think, trial matching is a key element when I think hospitals and when pharmaceutical companies look for the right set of uh, yeah, patients to clearly, I think, uh, yeah, work on new medication, I think it's very, very difficult to them to really find uh, yeah, the patients or the patients to subscribe, actually, I think, uh, yeah, to the trial. With the matching of uh, yeah, data of patients, it allows not only, I think, uh, the trials to be more efficient, but it allows the first time for the patient to be in control of the data, and secondly, to monetize the data. Because I think uh, yeah, today, this is something that is really, I think, uh, yeah, at question, look, number one, how much control does uh, yeah, the patient have over the data, and can the data, can the data be monetized uh, yeah, by the patient? So a very different uh, approach to, I think, uh, the healthcare system. But it's not limited uh, yeah, to that. It can equally be used, I think, to have specific uh, yeah, health plans, treatment plans, clearly, I think, matched uh, to the patient for any other healthcare application. So last but not uh, yeah, least, I think uh, yeah, there is an example that most probably is very popular in the future in, 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 in Spain. There's a world, I think, famous uh, yeah, sport, football. Right? We are working with one of the biggest associations in, 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 in sports to really reform the sport football, make it more entertaining, more immersive, and I think I get this on the basis of using and exchanging and monetizing I get data. Each and every player through a game, football player through a game, produces about seven and a half million data points seven and a half million data points. With a Nokia data marketplace, we are making the data available for the football association, for the players, and for the sponsors and broadcasters to clearly, I think, I use associated with their interests. But it is at the interest of the player that they can decide what to monetize and how to monetize. Other than they have agreement with a sponsor, then it's maybe a slightly different uh, yeah, game. But it's not only about our monetization. It's also about players' health and other effects I think it might have on them. So, in summary, we have worked out how to simplify global data connectivity and collection. We are now tracking the data exchange and monetizing challenge with Nokia Data Marketplace using private blockchain technology. And this will enable CSPs, consortiums, enterprises, and individuals to become ecosystem orchestrators and participates and will unlock additional potential of 5G use cases. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frederick. That was fascinating. Right. Uh, now we're moving straight on to our first expert panel uh, of the afternoon. And that's going to be moderated by Jim Moorish, who is a founding director of Transformer Insights. Jim, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, can I ask my panelists to come up, please? So we have Shabazz Ali from uh, Telenorm, Pakistan. We have... Um, Hans-Peter Bobst from Rode Schwartz. We have Friedrich Tauger, who you are going to see again. Uh, please come up. And uh, we have Samir Viru from AWS. Please come up.
<clears throat> Excellent. Welcome, everybody. Um, opportunity to take the masks off. Uh, do you want to, <laughs> would you just like to give a quick 20 second, 30 second introduction to, to yourselves? Just say who you are, where you're from, what your focus on, on IoT, data, 5G, and so on is. Yeah. So, hi, everyone. My name is Shabazz. I am heading IoT at Telnor Pakistan. Uh, we are currently uh, scaling the IoT in emerging markets. Um, and we are doing some great stuff in different verticals, that is mobility, energy management, asset management, and industrial IoT as well. Thank you. Friedrich. Friedrich Trevöger from uh, Nokia. Uh, look, I think I would characterize myself as being passionate uh, on IoT changing uh, yeah, the world and making us, I think, uh, yeah, really act uh, yeah, together more, uh, I think, uh, yeah, more closer than we ever would do without. Hans Peter Bobst, I'm the CEO of Rode Schwarz Swissqual AG. We are focusing on quality, on wireless quality, IoT, mobile phone devices, as well as security. Um, Samir Buyuru, I uh, run the telco vertical for Amazon Web Services, and uh, we put stuff like hard disks in the cloud and connect them. That's what we do. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. So th th this panel session is entitled Extracting Value from Critical Data for 5G IoT. Um, there's, there's many concepts in there. Um, and, and we're going to be talking about business values. So it's not just monetary value and selling data. We're talking about business value that a business can drive from data. And, and it's communications rather than just the data. So it's a slightly wider interpretation. Um, but I'd just like to start off uh, with, with an example, I think. Shabazz, do you want to give an example of, of where data has been used to drive business value? Yeah. So um, in my opinion, the uh, the companies who are working with the big data and they want to drive the value for their customers by solving their right jobs to be done are more favorable. Uh, big data can provide the opportunity to monetize across the whole value chain and uh, all, for almost all of the players. So the need of the time for the investor perspective, it's just like they need the quicker wins and so on and so forth. So the need of the time is to pick the low hanging fruit first and then uh, monetize the overall value chain. Mm. Long-term IoT play is, is, should, should not be discouraged, but it should not be an exclusive strategy to monetize the overall value chain, uh, but to re create shorter wins. Uh, I would like to give an example from a frontier market like Pakistan. Um, we uh, identified a use case for a large FMCG um, by solving their problem to identify and uh, to give the information about their ice cream trikes on the field. Yeah, sure. So we further enhance this uh, solution by providing them the most favorable hotspots in the cities, along with the most favorable ice cream SKUs, which they need to put on those specific routes. And uh, guess what? The, the result was they resulted in, in, in incremental revenue of 10 to 15 percent. Well, that's huge for an FMCG mobile business. So that's the kind of a real value, I would say, um, from a big data. The, um, in addition to this, the, the, big, the IoT business cases should be looked from a broader perspective, I can say. Um, they need patience, time to generate that data, time to analyze that data, and then create value out of it. Th thank you. It's an interesting example, actually, and quite a sophisticated one, because the first stage of adoption of IoT and digitally, digitally transformative solution tends to be to do the same thing but reduce costs. True. And the next step tends to be to doing something better. And yeah. your ice cream people are you know, clear, clearly changing their value proposition, improving their business, not just saving costs. That's True. a great example. Um, but, the, but the data has to be reliable. I mean, you know, to take decisions based on data, that data, you need to know that that uh, data means what it says it means it, that it's reliable um, and and you know that raises the concept of you know testing and making sure that devices actually can provide uh, the, the, the data as required in a reliable way uh, Hans Peter have you got do you want to expand on that concept a little yeah sure I mean just looking at the topic of this panel right uh, extracting value of critical data in 5g IOT I mean, that's, that can ring many bells, right? Uh, extracting value of critical data. There are 
questions which might come up with potential customers such as, all right, who owns that data? I mean, Frederick, you mentioned that in your speech. Who owns the data? How can we ensure that this data is safe and protected? So I'm talking about cybersecurity. Can we identify potential attacks to data? Can we act uh, in, in time on, on such um, an attack, a potential attack, and can we solve the problem? So that's certainly an important aspect. If, if we don't properly address that, we might not um, be able to create the needed trust to jump onto such a concept. The other aspect, I believe, is indeed uh, the quality. Uh, quality of the data combined with uh, 5G or mobile IoT devices has, again, many aspects. Um, quality can be such that you might collect wrong information based on the faulty sensor, and you might take wrong decisions based on that. So the question we need to address, and we need to have an explanation on that, on how we address that, is indeed how do we ensure that the data we collect is good data mm -hmm. to take the right decision and not come to wrong, wrong conclusions. And, and these are aspects where we as uh, Rode Schwartz are, are trying to address to help solutions like that to come to success and obviously create trust with customers. Okay, that uh, sounds extremely sensible. I mean, it, 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 you know, the, the, the right data has to go into the system before you can make the right decisions based on that data. Um, now, now, I mean, your example, Shabazz, you were talking about extracting data building business value on that data, but, but there are more opportunities that come with sharing data between different partners. Um, so would somebody like to, does anyone want to get some thoughts on you know, how data is being shared at the moment, some of the, some of the successful examples, I yeah. guess? Any, anyway, I mean, yeah. Samir or Friedrich, you're probably the Sure, happy to go. Um, first of all, privileged to be on here with three of our customers. So thank you. Uh, that being said, um, we, we have a, so, so we have a vision, right? That we, when we started out, the data was being transported to the cloud, right? But now it's, we're really progressing the other way. The cloud is migrating to the data with the edge stuff that we're doing with Nokia, with Telenor, yeah. right? Uh, for example. And w what that does is it provides the ability for multiple subsets of data to migrate to where the decision needs to be made, mm -hmm. right? And so that is a fundamental shift that we are heavily investing in. Mm -hmm. And when the data from, a, uh, a, from an EMR, an electronic me medical record, then combines with the aforementioned smartwatch that you're wearing of us, for example, right? Let's act on that data locally, hmm. quickly, and that is where we see the value. And we have hundreds of thousands of data sources that are now being made available um, on Amazon and being monetized through stuff like the data exchange that you built, Frederick, at Nokia, right? And that Telenor is also investing in, right? And so that's where the value comes from. That, that eclectic mix of industries. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can build on that because I think it's a very interesting concept. I think the first, what I believe we need to acknowledge, data economy is a global economy. It's not the local economy, mm -hmm. but the data are collected and they arrive local mm -hmm. in very specific environments. And I think that's the first thing we all need uh, to acknowledge when we talk about IA uh, data. Because we are very much used to constraining the environment IA uh, first and say, that's, that's my data. Only yeah. here it can exist. So I think uh, yeah, that's number one uh, when, when, when we talk about it. But as I mentioned uh, yeah, before, we need to find ways to clearly allow the data without being moved from A to B, I think, to be handled. Also, I think, uh, yeah, for making sure it's not fake data. Mm -hmm. I think to be run by proper analytics and to be proper assessed, to be proper secured, right, uh, on the requirements of the data owner. I think these are all uh, yeah, steps we need to build into the data economy. And I think, uh, yeah, in order to be credible, what is really required to create a set of rules, common rules, for this global data economy. Because only after that, I think, we can properly start monetizing 
and really putting data into use or as an asset class. Because today we are talking about, I think, uh, yeah, data becoming an yeah. asset class. I think uh, that is really, really, I think, sitting on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And only then, I think, this will be a credible model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and further building what, Jim, you have said that uh, um, the use of the data across the overall IoT value chain is, is very important. And I think uh, I can just give you another example from, again, Pakistan. There, there's a large uh, energy sector company who wants to provide the clean water by uh, desalinization of sea water mm -hmm. to the premium housing community. Mm -hmm. And the management wants to monetize the overall value chain by um, observing the consumption patterns of the household. Mm -hmm. So this will generate a lot of data. And these, if we talk about the solution stack, it, it will cover the, um, the IoT sensors, flow meters for on household and industrial side, and, and the mobile wallet payment for the payment collections, and uh, the Google Lightweight CRM for the customer management. So there are like players in the ecosystem who will use that data mm -hmm. for their own monetization and consumption. So the, as, as Frederick said, though, so it it's should be across the board. Uh, it should be the ownership, yes, with the com complement of the rules. It should be available uh, across the board. Okay, um, it, definitely. And, and, and I want to circle back on the topic of, of, of sharing standards, of sharing of data, and potentially APIs, and how that whole thing evolves. But before we get to that, I just want to focus again on the origination of the data um, and, and, and the accuracy of it. Um, so, Hans Peter, you and I were chatting some some while ago, um, and 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 you mentioned the wider concept of trustworthiness. So it's not just that the data is coming from the device and the device is functioning as it should, but you know no, nobody's upset the device. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been reconfigured. It's running the right software, but yeah. You know, and there's and 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 the con context. Do you want to? Exp yeah. Let's explain that wider concept of I trust. Think, <clears throat> I think the data aspect is an important one. I believe we we should. Data is not equal to data, right? Uh, data might have to be classified uh, in multiple dimensions. Uh, dimension can be the ownership of the data. In, the, in one of the examples from Frederick, it was about healthcare. Obviously, the ownership of the data is the person. Uh, in another example, the ownership of the data might be the, the one running an IoT network. So there must be a classification of the data so that it's clear who has the right ownership and privacy on that. The other one is, uh, back to your question, is about making sure that we do not have wrong data or fake data. So we might have to think about ways to label data saying, this is valid data, I trust that data, I can assure that this data is correct and I can use that to take decisions. Versus, wait a minute, um, we might have wrong sensors, we might have outages in 5G, we might have all sorts of, of things which might question the quality of, a date, of the data, which requires eventually something on top which monitors or detects uh, whether the quality uh, data is valid or not. Absolutely, and, and I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but each one of those dimensions or ways in which you classify data, that, that needs to become metadata associated with the data which needs to flow into these sharing environments yes. and be supported by the exchange of it and 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 then standards and the APIs. So I'll come back. Um, does anyone want to give some th some some comment on how the standardisation of data sharing is developing over what timelines it'll develop? I would say from 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 our experience, when I look at the standardisation, I think uh, yeah, today it's still dependent on individual streams. Right? When we look at, for example healthcare, right? I think, uh, yeah, we are now seeing some standardization uh, going on because it is a critical element. So I think, uh, yeah, this, uh, yeah, be, this data are really, really, I think, uh, yeah, perceived very critical when they are being processed. Mm -hmm. So here, I think, uh, yeah, we are far more advanced already. I think uh, there are healthcare, I think, institutions that would uh, yeah, clearly make sure pharmaceutical, I think, standards that uh, I think those data fall into. I think, uh, yeah, here we are rather on the safer side. I think uh, then when I look at uh, yeah, the elements where government uh, yeah, is uh, in control of some data, mm -hmm. clearly I think uh, yeah, there is regulation by policy. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand side, 80, 90% of the data that are used for 
entertainment purposes, as I said, uh, yeah, football. I think, and for purpose, I think that is not regulated and not controlled because the data are not mission critical. Jim, I'm not actually sure how the data, I think, uh, yeah, will be assured in the future. We will have, I think, uh, yeah, algorithms uh, yeah, that will clearly make sure that they are consistent across a group of data or a set of data, but the absolute assurance, I'm not uh, yeah, seeing at the horizon at this stage. Uh, I'll take that a little bit further, right? Our default position has always been that the customer owns the data, right? No ifs, no buts, right? What we do provide is a set of controls that gives them granular access to what parts of the data they want to expose to whom, when, and in what schema, and also uh, when they can retract all of that and, and to track all of that. So all of those tools exist, but the overarching principle is that the customer owns the data and the customer, he or she, can decide to what level they can mm. expose that data. Um, I, 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 I worry about over-standardization, right? Mm -hmm. I worry about data schema normalization, right? that stifles innovation, right? So let's just give the developers, the individuals, the enterprises, the tools to manage it how they see fit. Yes, um, yeah, I, 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 I agree with that dynamic. Um, it, might be worth in, I mean, it, it might be worth drilling into the concept of data exchange. Um, so, so there's a data exchange which takes the information in and then provides it onto a third party. And there's a data hub which would help a data client navigate potential sources and not actually participate in the contracting process, but you know, connect partner A and partner B. Mm -hmm. And what that speaks, what that's much more consistent with is the kind of model you're describing there, where people have much more control of the data, but, but the, on the flip side, you need to know who the counterparty is. You need, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a much more complex count, contracting process. If you move into a purely hubbed environment where the hub is engaged, it's supporting that transaction, then it needs to be much more standardized. The need to be commitments so that the end user, well, he knows where his data is coming from. If he's inputting data to the hub, he knows it's not ending up in Russia, for example. Yeah, and, and all that needs to sit in a framework. So you've got really two quite different things. Any, anybody got any views on how the world's going to evolve with these two? Look, just, just one statement I, I think I get, because we, we subscribe to two, I think, concepts. The one, as I said, uh, where it's regulated and where it's really mission critical. Mm -hmm. And here I stick to my statement, I think, uh, yeah, very, very clearly, you need to police it and you need, I think, to make sure that the data are appropriately cleansed and then, and then, and then, and then clear. But then, I think, uh, yeah, as you would have almost in every, I think, uh, yeah, web-based uh, yeah, business, I think uh, the person that uh, really consumes, I think, that buys the data, will rate the quality of the data, the data at the end of the day. And we see this already in many trials we do, right? Uh, yeah, we do environmental data, I think, trials, right? Uh, yeah, so people share environmental data and people consume the environmental data. And they, I think, then rate the data, so, or the data source as reliable, accurate, uh, yeah, timely, and everything. And uh, at the end of the day, this is one mechanism that doesn't really be need to be totally accurate. But over time, it will tell, I think, uh, yeah, what is a reliable, accurate data source if it's not mission critical and not policed. And I think it will sort itself out in a way that I think uh, yeah, you don't need to police uh, yeah, data that I think for entertainment purpose or anything be, that is not going beyond that. Yeah, so, so I, I would agree with friend, um, my panel mate. but. Um, the point is this, that um, the owner of the data is the customer. He, he will remain the owner of the data. But yes, the, 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 the overall value chain where the data flows, that needs to be regulated. The standardization needs to be done. But yes, it could be a vertical approach we can take, maybe. But some mission critical data needs to be more standardized. But yes, I would agree to Samir as well that uh, over standardization uh, may restrict the flow of data and may restrict the overall value driven by the data as well. So which can be taking the vertical approach uh, for the data standardization. Any other thoughts from anyone on this topic? 
Yeah, maybe, okay, I think we need to differentiate eventually also between the type of data again, because what you mentioned, um, Frederick, was entertainment data indeed might not be critical data. So critical data can be data which you collect from sensor managing a power plant. And obviously on that point, it's a different game, right? We yeah. have, then we have to have rules. So we cannot just say, all right, we extract information of uh, critical data coming from sensors for a power plant. So it is indeed, uh, we need to differentiate the application on when do we use what application for what, what data. So the type of data is important. Therefore, I mentioned again that the session, the panel today was referring to critical data, which to me is a sensitive topic. Yes, and, and, and there's a related concept of commercial risk. Um, if, Correct. If, if, if I am a agricultural supplier and I need weather information, there could be weather information which is crowdsourced from people's sensors in their back gardens, or there could be weather information which is sourced by the Weather Channel, which is owned by IBM. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of them probably has some level of SLAs. Yeah. Um, so, so are we going to get two different development paths? Is the Anybody want to? Yeah, indeed. I believe the collection of data needs some differentiation. Some collection might need some regulation, and some data might not re need regulation. Um, Non-critical data doesn't need regulation. Uh, critical data instead um, might need regulation. And in particular, when we talk about data exchange of critical data, we might have to agree on certain common formats so that we can exchange without exchanging or without entering into a specific risk. So we, we can exchange data, we can benefit from combining data without creating a, a particular risk for uh, a critical application. But can I maybe, I think, uh, yeah, and back to you, and look, isn't it I don't starting want to be the party crusher by No, no, <laughs> isn't it starting a little bit earlier? I think uh, yeah, uh, many data are derived by sensors, mm -hmm. right? Mission critical. Isn't it already at the level of certifying, I think, the sensors and making sure that the sensor environment is capable of delivering, I think, the set of data? Isn't this, I think, an uh, uh, earlier stage we need to assure? Yeah, m maybe. Um... But still, sensor can, sensors can be hacked, sensors can break, sensors can deliver wrong temperature, wrong, wrong data. So, yeah, still the quality of the data is an aspect and the, the exchange and the regulation of some formats might be, might be an aspect. Not for every application, not for every application. Yeah. I'm talking about critical data. Uh, any other thoughts on that topic? So okay, we're, we're, we're down to less than three minutes, so I'm going to make this the last question um, and to, to anybody. Um, so so there's been, there have been several statements that the customer owns the data. So if we're in a scenario where there is a factory which outputs things and there's a packing machine um, and there's data coming from that packing machine into some external environment, um, it's clear who owns that data. If that packing machine is a servitized proposition, so it is provided by a third party and leased to this factory, who owns the data? Anybody? Uh, My view is it's the owner of the asset and, and, and the lease allows them yeah, to open I, up the, the sharing to the person who has custody of the asset. But Look, uh, anybody? Uh, yeah, Jim, uh, I think you, you, you have given the answer almost, I think, <laughs> to your own question. But I think uh, yeah, there will be nuances. And there will be nuances, I think, uh, yeah, based on the commercial terms under yeah. which I think uh, asset is handed uh, to someone. Because uh, I think, is it just, I think, uh, yeah, the asset that is being offered, I think, uh, yeah, to the factory? Or is it, I think, uh, yeah, the data, does it include, I think, a maintenance uh, yeah, concept that relies on data? So I believe there is much more to it, but what I do believe, I think, uh, yeah, much rather than having a static, I think, uh, yeah, commercial agreement, we will see some associated smart contracts that I think in the future will not only talk about, I think, the asset ownership and the transfer of rights of asset, but also, I think, the transfer of right of 
data coming from the asset. And I do believe there will be a separation of the terms A, the asset itself, yeah. and the terms B, the data, particular if data become an asset class in their own right. That's interesting. So you, so, so you unhinge the data stream and trade it separately from the asset. And you have a, a, an exchange. I would envision this at least, yeah. I think, uh, as one way of monetizing data and taking the load of, I think, even the purchase price mm. of, a, of, I think, a regular physical asset. Okay. Other thoughts? We're down to the last few tens of seconds. Yeah, our, our position is simple. The, the person who owns the data is the person who has put it in our cloud, right? And, it, and you get it into the cloud as quickly as you can. That's a, that's a great answer from a cloud perspective. It's a, it's a perfect answer. Um, right, we're down to two seconds now. So I should say thank you very much to our panel. I found it very interesting. I hope everybody out there found it interesting too. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and to all our panelists. Um, that was a fascinating point about data ownership at the, over, at the end there and uh, a future of trading data in a responsible way. I can see that happening. Um, we're just waiting for our uh, next speaker to be uh, mic'd up, and um, I'm very pleased to say we've got two speakers uh, from Zariat um, on um, IoT security who have a, a corporate mission to bring order back to IoT. So um, I'm looking forward to actually to reduce corporate chaos, I think is the term uh, within that. So it's going to be fascinating to see. So I'm um, about to call uh, Jimmy Jones uh, to the stage, who's uh, head of re Thank you. Head of security. Thank you. Hi. Um my name's Ara Larson. I'm head of research at Zariet. We are an IoT MVNO focused on security. OK, and uh, as Andrew said, my name's Jimmy Jones. I'm uh, head of security at uh, Zariet. And we're here today to start to talk about uh, eSIM and iSIM and also the processes that, that go around that because we think it's a real a game changer, really. The way it, it allows us to uh, address the um, IoT ecosystem. I think what it allows us to do is be far more dynamic and far more involved in that ecosystem and, and actually start to show what value that cellular can actually bring. And I think that's key because I think it, if we get involved like that, I think we can calm down the misgivings that some of the um, IoT community have about using cellular. Um, I think we've all heard of a pushback on cost, but I think we can address that. Great, so telecoms has been integral to our lives for 100 years now with mobile with us for 40-ish. And our networks have been so reliable that even from childhood, we've come to consider them a lifeline almost. We, if we came home this evening and saw our house on fire, it's our phones we would use to call the fire brigade, not WhatsApp, email, Twitter. We'd call the fire brigade with our phones, and that's trust. And that trust has taken 100 years to establish, and we think that's hugely valuable and hugely important because we believe that IoT can only truly achieve its full potential if we establish public trust. So as an industry, how do we bring this trust and confidence to our IoT customers? And I think the answer to that is uh, twofold. So the first one I'm going to say is that you have to have security to have trust. But you'd expect me to say that because of my job title and the fact that we've just said that's what we want to do. But we, we did want to bring security to IoT connectivity. And we made a decision to, to go with cellular because that's the best starting point. We're all aware that we may have problems, but we're actually doing pretty well. And the second point is while as an industry we have been successful in delivering networks, we need to change focus now. The customer, the final customer solution is really what is key. 
and all the vendors from the device manufacturers to the application developers and network operators, they're all just cogs in the wheel to deliver that final solution. Okay, and it's the perfect time to have that discussion because 5G has opened the discussion with the enterprises, opened the discussion with our uh, customers, and that's allowing us to talk about uh, EUICC and eSIM. And what we found is when we started to do that, when we started to speak to them about bringing tangible benefits um, using the eSIM, things they can see, then the interest levels went up massively. And what that did is, it, we're going to see a demo in a few minutes. Um, what it allows us to do is it start to collaborate. And when you start to collaborate, that's when you be, uh, can start to add some value and you can start to, to, to really innovate. And it's not possible to help with everything, of course, but by sharing and pooling expertise and experience and talking through problems, explaining what's possible and using fresh set of eyes to identify opportunities or consider issues, that's really what drives innovations. We can talk to our customers and tell them what technology we can bring or will bring in the future, but it's really by working with them and their vendors right now makes it into something tangible. And that's where the real value lies. And that's powerful, and that's where we see ESIM. Yeah, so a little bit of background uh, on this slide. You can obviously see EUICC, eSIM. We're going to be talking about ISIM. I think the, the panel a little bit after us will, will touch on new SIM as well. Um, so way back in 2G, we just had a SIM, hardware, software together. When we moved to 3G and video calling and things like that, long time ago, um, we started to split that to software and uh, hardware. We've moved on from that now. We've started to overlay a tier of processing, over-the-air um, administration and management that we can bring to it to make the whole system more dynamic. And that's key because moving forward, that's really going to be where we, are, we can bring that value. And that we, we will continue to talk. And we do need to bear in mind that the EU ICC can actually be delivered on plastic today. Um, embedded SIMs will be what we talk about mostly in this uh, presentation and we will actually, a lot of the use cases we, we uh, outline will be about eSIM, iSIM, but this is available now. Uh, the, the nuances of terminologies aside, the benefits that the combination of hardware, software and processes can bring are uh, up until this point anyway, hugely underappreciated and as a result underutilized. People simply don't know what is possible or underestimate its usefulness. We see four hugely valuable core benefits that can address some of the central issues that we see in IoT today and actually in the wider telecom industry and we will go through all these in detail in a, in a little while but we just wanted to highlight that this is all possible now. Exactly, that, that's in completely true and what we're going to see in the demo uh, in a, just a little bit is how we used our in-house skills with the eSIM being able to deliver, uh, sorry, develop uh, applets and uh, different profiles to support customers, how that really meant that we could engage with a non-telco entity and really make something a little bit more innovative. Because if I'm honest, I, I, I made a mistake when I was, I, I, uh, I talk all the time about being end-to-end -end and ecosystem, ecosystem. But when I first went to the app company, who are an open source end-to-end uh, uh, encryption company or encryption company. What I actually was looking for was to embed their keys on a device, um, similarly to uh, the excellent GSMA Safe program. Um, but I was looking to lower the barrier of adoption a little, and I was looking for a couple of little areas that I felt would make something that would be um, that would really support that initiative. Um, but that was that was wrong actually, because I was just thinking with my telecoms head. I had telecom blinkers on. And that's where collaboration is so important. It can give a much more cohesive um, approach to the ecosystem. And all it took was for the app company to ask, well, what about the rest? The end solution is not the application server. It's the user's device or the application management or the part that actually is communicating to 
the IoT thing. And this gives a much more comprehensive approach to the solution. And that's the solutions focus that telecom needs to adopt. Yeah, exactly. So what we're going to show now is a quick demo of what we, what we created. Um, it's a hypothetical situation where a guy's been asked to get fit, and he's got a, a smart mountain bike or something similar, and he's going to share some da data with his uh, doctor, uh, some more data, some different data with his personal trainer, and then he's also going to get the techie to come and fix the bike at some point. Okay, we're going to start. Ooh. Go back, go back and then. Okay. Yeah, and then leave. Yeah. Should leave it. Yeah. That's why we should have let Lara do that. <laughs> okay. So this is the device we were we were working on. Uh, it's basically a Raspberry Pi underneath. Um, you can see over that a modem, a LTE modem, and a one and a half inch uh, screen on top of that. This is a, a um, heart rate and. Um, oxygen monitor and that can read your pulse and your oxygen uh, levels once you put your finger on it. So you can see on the top of the um, device that's being read at the moment. That data is actually being encrypted and we'll see it sent to an application in just a moment and that encryption starts directly from the device and it's all the way through to the device we're going to see uh, just now. So the key here really is that the keys are held on the device and only the device. So it's the end device or user that has complete control of the data. So here, the data is being shared with a doctor and the doctor is being presented with both the heart rate and the oxygen saturation. But the customer is in complete control of the data. So say they wanted to share data with their fitness instructor as well. They might only want to share heart rate and not oxygen saturation. So here, this is the same application being used by a different receiving at sign. And they're only receiving part of the data. And like Jimmy said, this data is fully encrypted from the device to the palm of your hand. Yeah, the, the whole point is you've got full control. And that is important because here we see Athletic Andy. He's his bicycle's broken, and he, you just saw on the left-hand side that he never released his location. And you can see on the right, Mr. Tech, he can't see it either. And he slides the bars across, and what he's doing now is releasing that data um, to Mr. Tech's fix it. But he's only doing that, and you can see that now. And you can see Mr. Tech fix it only sees it now. As soon as he was to go back in and slide that backwards, then that, that uh, information wouldn't be released anymore. So that encrypted in data that, owned, that can't be intercepted at any point except Mr. Tech fix it and Athletic Andy, um, they, that is controlled by that device and by that either device or human being. Um, so that's all the way from the device to the palm of your hand. And that's important because that's GDPR. Now that was all about um, security and trust, but let's look at where eSIM and iSIM actually played in that. The eSIM and iSIM allow you to give you that tamper-proof um, route of trust. There's no, there's no SIM tray, so the, the water can't get in, the dust can't get in, but it's difficult for the hacker to actually get there as well. The device and, um, and the SIM are, are, are very closely matched, so you've got that control. If something's lost or stolen, you can actually stop the uh, service via the application or via the SIM. And all of that over-the-air control and management is um, via the, the GSMA's um, very well-documented um, standards that cover the manufacturer's role, the SIM provider's role, and the operator's role. And that is really key because it brings simplicity. It brings simplicity across the full lifetime of the, um, of the system. So from manufacturer to provisioning through the lifetime, you have that simple control. And that... That needs to be brought, and we need to push that more to our, um, to our customers because it's a, a unique way of connecting to simply the, the, most, um, the most ubiquitous network on the planet. And th this value add is already happening, and it's why Zariot, we at Zariot chose our SIM vendor based on their strong eSIM, iSIM story. 
flexibility, huge for, for IoT. Um, solutions, in, in IT terms at least, have massive lifetimes. And what is the right decision now may not be what's beneficial in five years time, say. Um, the flexibility that remote provisioning provides means you don't have to go to the site of devices. It re relieves pressure from decision makers, which benefits the IoT solution owner, but also the whole ecosystem, as decisions can be made faster and, and projects deployed quicker. Yeah, and the operators get that uh, advantages as well. So it's the only way that we can hyperscale. It's the only way we can securely and simply hyperscale to, to deal with those IoT volumes that we're all wanting and expecting. Additionally, the manufacturers, it's great for them. Uh, we need to push this more. They, we don't need to put an, uh, a SIM tray in there. They've already saved 50 cents. They don't need a, a TPM or another uh, secure element. There you're looking at a dollar, dollar fifty. We've just taken $2 out of the, pro, um, the production price of an IoT device, and that, that soon add up. And actually, Lara touched on this. Control is really important to all of us. We heard it in the last panel, actually. As our lives become more uh, connected, users, enterprise, everybody wants to grab that control back. And we need to make sure that we, we can um, we can push this information to people because as things go on, that's going to be hugely important. Yep, it really is important. We have to be, as a telecom, we have to be more of an active, integrated member of the IoT ecosystem. Otherwise, we will miss out on opportunities to participate, to pass on expertise, and to assist in general. And that's bad for us, but also for innovation. No part of the ecosystem can work in silos anymore. We have to pool together expertise, different perspectives, and all work together to find the most effective answers to a shared goal. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And what we've got now, we've got the opportunity for technology to allow us to open that um, open that conversation. It allows us to open the door to something that's already there, but we haven't spoken about enough, and that's EUICC and eSIM. Because as we've seen ourselves so quickly, that drives collaboration, and that drives innovation. And that is what we have to aim to do if we want a trusted and secure connected future. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, Laura. Laura that was fantastic. Um, right, now I'm, um, I'm pleased to introduce our, our last expert panel. And this is the last session of uh, today's summit. And uh, I'd like to introduce Sergio uh, oh, sorry, Cosolino from TIM, who is also the group chairman of eSIM within the GSMA. So um, Sergio, please come to the stage. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Let me invite for this panel on the stage my colleagues, first of all, Jimmy, who is head of security at Zariot, then Loic Bonvart, Vice President of Product and Marketing at Kitchen, Mona Pars Mogadan, Senior Product Manager, New Access Technologies at Dodge Telecom, and finally, yeah. Stefan Ketelgas. Embedded product marketing director at Thales. So, welcome to this panel. That's the final panel of the, set of the day, so it could be quite difficult to uh, listen, but we are going to maintain the attention quite high. So, let's start from the uh, last presentation we saw. For the first question, is just for G Jimmy. Uh -huh. uh, you are considering that security and connectivity are the two pillars uh, for uh, successful IoT applications. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's the real value of a SIM for the IoT market? Um, yeah, so I think that twofold. So, the, uh, first of all, there's the, the form factor. I mean, obviously, the form factor allows it to be much more secure. That supports um, many different um, verticals, the healthcare and automotive come straight to mind, utilities as well, actually. Um, so that, that's key, that, that difficult, that, that tamper-proof 
uh, access and the, the close control with the uh, device is, it, I think is invaluable. But beyond that, and that's not as obvious, I don't think, to the, to the public, is the flexibility. The flexibility we're able to bring by being able to add multiple profiles and bring multiple, um, add new functions over the air as, as the device develops, I think that's, that's really important because as we said, if you can bring tangible benefits to the customer, it's, it's much better, it's much easier for them to understand end-to-end -end encryption or anti nc capture applet or whatever you put in there. And we can do that for security, but we could do that for anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be a secure uh, solution. It, it could be anything that supports their, their um, needs. And if you think about private 5G, it's been everywhere here, private LTE. Um, I think that's, that's really important because that would be because they would do that because they want either a bespoke or they're very uh, risk averse. So I think it's the flexibility. Thanks. Uh, we have seen that the IoT market is growing so fast and we are seeing millions and millions of new subscriptions every day. So, uh, our maintaining the, uh, the reliable connectivity is a real important. So, uh, Stefan, how do you um, see the, the value of eSIM for IoT connectivity act activation? Can you hear me? No. No. I use this one. So is it, is it okay now? I, I think it is okay. Okay. So when it comes to uh, connectivity activation, I think uh, we, we, we should um, uh, first of all make uh, an observation. So we're working on, on eSIM for many, many years. And the, the value of flexibility, Jimmy talked about it, uh, is definitely there with the technology. But when we look at, uh, at uh, the IoT uh, players, our customers, um, in many instances, they, they don't use this flexibility from day one because they ship their products with a connectivity that they are already decided upon. But what I think is that when we, it comes to IoT, and especially the massive IoT we've discussed today, um, the more players you will, uh, you will uh, have in the, in the value chain uh, because of this massive IoT, the more difficult it will be to decide early on the, on the connectivity. So that means connectivity activation needs to be uh, provided at the proper time and late in the process, uh, ideally on the field. So this is where services are needed, additional services to make the activation of the connectivity easier, especially for the new enterprises who want to embrace cellular to connect their devices. Good. Uh, we have seen that the SIM is not static, and uh, we saw the evolution into eSIM. E and then now, today, we are facing the integrated uh, SIM. So um, uh, my question is just for uh, Deutsche Telekom and for Mona. Specifically, we know that uh, you are in developing a specific uh, uh, product that's called new SIM. So what are the differences between SIM, eSIM, and new SIM? Yeah, sure. So uh, for eSIM, as, as you mentioned, we have, uh, with all the infrastructure behind it, we provide the flexibility for the customers to decide later on to switch the profiles if they wish and go for other operators. Uh, with integrated SIM, so as integrated EU ICC, the whole thing goes directly into the baseband chipset, and it has a lot of benefit for the customers, specifically when we are talking about IoT customers, the, cost, the total cost of ownership is quite important for them. So by moving uh, the SIM functionality into the chipset, we get rid of the SIM card as a separate physical component. So we can reduce this one um, material on the bill of material of the customers. Uh, and yeah, it also has other benefits like the, um, a bit of battery efficiency, I would say, uh, because it's a system on chip solution, so the baseband doesn't need to communicate with a separate physical component anymore. Um, and yeah, with NewSIM specifically, this is also an integrated SIM, but uh, this is specifically designed for low-cost IoT. So for those customers and for those use cases that they need just a simple connectivity, and they are going usually to do national rollout, so, uh, and it's important for them to have connectivity in their devices. And, uh, but 
Mm, yeah, as Jimmy mentioned, uh, it, security is anyway very important. So that's why we also have the exclusive uh, security evaluation concept for NUSIM to make sure that all the implementation for NUSIM is secure enough that our profiles goes into. Thanks. Uh, the, que the following question is for Loïc. Uh, we know that the SIM creates a new paradigm for the IoT connectivity and uh, especially when we are going to keep in mind all the security concerns. So what do you think are the main challenges uh, for eSIM, iSIM? Uh, adoption when we are going to introduce them on the IoT environment? Thanks for the question. Yeah. So we did have a phone also. <laughs> Go like this. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, so, um, so basically one of the key things that we had uh, for seen in the early days of uh, eSIM is notably maybe some interop issues among vendors, etc. And I think we've come a long way since uh, uh, since the early days of uh, eSIM and, uh, and RSP platform for automotive notably, right? So now we've, uh, for example, as a more recent so newcomer in the industry here, uh, Risky again, we've done a lot of effort to try to resolve these interop issues and work uh, with colleagues from Thales and so on to, to make sure that the product works uh, when we have to deploy it and have to exchange, basically, profiles, etc. right? So that's, uh, that problem is, is diminishing strongly, I would say. One other thing I want to point out is the fact that now eSIM is simply more widely available. We had a number of new customer engagement, notably in the IoT and VNO space, where basically they go eSIM first, right? Mm -hmm. And that's really something that is really recent in our eyes, where typically before it was larger MNOs who had deployed eSIM uh, for M2M or consumer. But now we see an acceleration of people and companies who are specialists into deploying IoTs uh, to, to really make those platforms available and eSIM in general available. The last point I have is um, something which we've seen more recently acutely in the last two years, which is the chipset shortage, right? Uh, or uh, secure, yeah, secure chip shortage in general, right? And I think what we've been really working on is to make sure that we find all the possible ways of finding supply when we talk about a discrete eSIM. And also to point out that uh, integrated SIM and their different variants brings new options to people who need to source this part to, to have customers go to market effectively. Right, and I think you will see on the show that there is a number of module vendors now available with uh, integrated SIM options mm -hmm. or embedded eSIM. And that's really a proof point that it it's starting to get simpler to basically deploy, right? Because you can take a module and go from there. Yeah, let's continue to maintain a focus on the security aspects related to the IoT applications. So uh, the following question is for Jimmy. Uh, I would just like to understand what, uh, do you believe it's important to uh, uh, mandatory requirements in order to deploy IoT security devices and uh, which are able to support uh, a really secure environment. Uh, uh, absolutely. The, the, the whole ecosystem is important, actually. That you can't look at uh, IoT security in isolation. We can't work in silos. The, unless you're securing all the way from the device through the network and the application, unless you're addressing the whole DNA of that uh, solution, then, then you're not gonna be able to secure it. So that's why we were pushing with uh, collaboration and cooperation, it was all the way through our uh, presentation. Um, because I, th I think that's really key. What you also need to do with that though, you need to back it up with a reason to do it. And I think that's why uh, legislation now is actually very good. I think it's a very good thing because if you think back, um, and I honestly believe this, I don't think it's gonna be very long before selling a device with poor cyber uh, health um, hygiene is gonna be as unacceptable as selling a car with no seat belts. And the only reason seat belts are in every car is because all the governments decided around the world that this is madness, we need to protect our citizens by putting seat belts in cars. They need to protect their citizens today uh, with their cyber because those two are combining. So I think your, your cyber experience and your, we've heard it before, your cyber experience, your physical experiences are gonna come together. So I think that that's key. And, but I think the fact that eSIM 
is available now and allows us to do stuff now, I think is key because it, we can open up the conversations, legislation opens it up, 5G, everybody's talking about that, brings people to talk about what's available. And by doing that, I think that's really good because I'm really, I really think eSIM is a, a really fantastic tool to be able to deliver that security. So we are, we are regarding an end-to-end -end security anyway. So um, I'm quite curious to, to learn from a UM manufacturer. Um, how can eSIM really take a value in this kind of end-to-end -end security, especially when we are going to scale up these IoT uh, applications? So how can we probably leverage on the eSIM functionality in order to achieve such a kind of end-to-end -end security? So the, 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 the eSIM by, by design is, is a secure product that has to be certified according mm -hmm. to industry standards. Mm -hmm. uh, this is to establish trust between the, the, the various stakeholders. So that means when you have a, a cellular IoT devices with an eSIM, you have a fantastic opportunity to leverage this built-in security that is available to do more than securing the access to the network itself. So I think this uh, uh, combined with the fact that with new form factors like integrated SIM that you mentioned, new SIM, or the integrated SIM uh, that is uh, standardized by the GSMA, um, this uh, technology will be available to more products uh, to s deliver more use cases, means that it's going to be almost ubiquitous. And that means in order to improve the security of your application, you can leverage, uh, again, this combination of secure software and secure hardware. And you don't have to add, uh, to add another secure element dedicated to this. Uh, plus, you can uh, also use the expertise of the EUM, um, because we know how to make these secure products, and we have been into this business for many, many years. Um, so you have a secure uh, security by design when you go for uh, an additional security service delivered by the ECM. And I think the example of uh, IoT Safe that has been uh, standardized at GSMA is fantastic because it exactly delivers uh, what, what you need as a device maker. It's uh, easy to integrate, security by design is provided, it's, uh, it's uh, open, it's scalable because you are using public key cryptography and it removes all the hassles of managing all these secrets. So this is really a very, very good solution that can be used to uh, serve a, a very uh, a large number of use cases. Yeah. Uh, when talking about uh, uh, IoT application, we are talking about uh, huge volumes of products. And uh, we are also talking about manufacturing these kind of products in a different way. So, uh, Loic, how could they sim simplify this kind of manufacturing process? And what are the values that could be provided in order to Im improve and enlarge the connectivity for IoT applications? So to your first point on the manufacturing processes, right? Uh, I think it's reducing the number of parameters for a device maker. Right, to bring a device to market, right? So before you had to basically select a cellular module, select the technology that you want to apply, select a SIM vendor, select the network, etc. So we are trying to simplify right, the steps that mm -hmm. an OEM has to take to go to market and build a cellular device. And also to make it more accessible. Quite often uh, people have the perception that cellular is only for large companies with an established volume, etc. It's really refreshing to company to see companies like uh, like Zayot and uh, the ad company to try to you know bring new ideas to the market and really putting security first right in their design and talking about it and promoting it and we also jointly for example promoted the the, uh, the, the WEF statement which is about allowing simple pillars to be uh, deployed into devices. So to your second point also on the or does it facilitate uh, global IoT deployment? Uh, one thing is, first, you have more and more modules available, right? Uh, that, uh, so it's actually more options for people to go cellular, mm -hmm. right? Across technologies, that's one. And also the point that uh, also uh, Stefan mentioned earlier is that the, the integrated EUICC, right? The ICM GSMS uh, approved is already there in terms of embedded security, right? So today you have all the rules that are already defined to bring 
a nice SIM which is GSMS certified. Mm -hmm. And we are working with partners like Sequence uh, or Alter Semiconductor to go on that route and, and really establish the capability to remotely manage an integrated SIM and have multiple uh, connectivity profiles available, right? So that really goes in the way of global connectivity availability uh, yeah, across the globe. Yeah, I'm quite passionate about iSIM because I can remember that when we started talking within the GSMA about iSIM in 2015, uh, we were considered completely crazy. I was one of the person who was raising this topic in the GSMA technology group at that time, and many of the members of the technology group were saying, okay, for, forget it. And now today it's a product. So uh, we are spending a lot of time in order to create a standard, and that's today it's a successful uh, product. So coming back again on this topic, Mona, what do you believe it could be the real benefits that I think could bring to uh, IoT use cases? What are the uh, use cases that you believe that could be take benefit of the IoT in the IoT environment? Yeah, very good question. So we don't just create a standards in sake of creating it, just doing it to, you know, bring it to the customers and the customer can benefit from it. So the integrated team has different, uh, yeah, benefits, like I said, the cut of on the costs, the simpler devices, smaller form factors, simpler, um, yeah, processes also for us as uh, operators and uh, talking about that we have uh, actually all the IoT use cases can benefit from that and there are some IoT use cases that require this as um, not optional but as a kind of must have. For example now we have a thin paper um, trackers yeah we cannot imagine that the SIM card goes into, into them or we, we have a very small form factor devices that are supposed to go, for example, in the shoes uh, to you know, monitor and also send location and also in case of emergency can contact, uh, the runner can contact the emergency. And all these use cases require a very small form factors and very secure uh, kind of implementation that ISIM can enable them. Good. We are coming back to the end of this panel. I have a final question for all the panelists. So what do you believe that could be the future of eSIM and what is going to be the rule of eSIM within IoT market? So who wants to start? I think, um, I think it's going to drive innovation. I think the, 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 the conversations there is going to drive innovation. And I think especially with the positivity that we've seen around um, MWC 22, I think that, that that change of uh, dynamic, now we're coming out of co touch wood, we're coming out of COVID. Um, I think that as that's, we can, we can uh, take that um, wave of enthusiasm forward because people have started using technology a lot more um, and that there is a bigger acceptance there and people can see that actually IoT has got, uh, that is valuable, that you can do stuff with it and people will actually use it. So I think that positivity and the fact that we've been locked up for two years and not been able to do anything will drive that ambition to, to innovate. Yeah, maybe I'll continue. I think, uh, you know, we are, I'm very big on simplification, right? Mm -hmm. Simplification will drive adoption and will spark innovation, right? I think that's uh, when it, we make it simple to understand, right, and start from the use case and try to find the fit for purpose form factor for the use case for the constraint of the use case, and that it's easily you know, tried uh, at low volume uh, for company to start and experiment and refine their model, then we'll have really innovation coming up. And yeah, really see to, pleased to see new companies coming to, uh, to Cellular to do this. Yeah, so uh, when you say IoT, uh, IoT is huge. I mean, it's from autonomous driving in the car to the simple smoke detector at home. So I, I guess we all need to acknowledge that there cannot be just one solution that, that can fill the requirements of all these use cases. So we have eSIM and integrated EUICC, which is great because it provides the flexibility for those customers that need it. 
we have uh, yeah, some simpler solutions like integrated SIM or new SIM that they provide just simple connectivity for the customers that don't even care which operator profile is in. As long as it's sending the data, it's, it's, it's uh, fine for them. And they never would t uh, think of changing the operator profiles because in IoT, to be realistic, the customers are paying prepaid for the connectivity. For five years prepaid, for 10 years prepaid, and uh, because the margins are quite low, they wouldn't go for another contract with another operator to pay again pre prepaid again for another connectivity, which they already paid before. So we need to, I, I think we need to somehow distinguish the segments and the markets and then try to address those requirements of the customers with maybe two or three or even more solutions. Okay, and for me, um, I, I agree with what uh, has been said uh, so far. Uh, simplicity is important, security is important, innovation. Uh, having more op options available is important too. Um, last year was a tough year, still uh, pandemic was there. The aftermath of the, or, or the consequence of the pandemic with the silicon shortage that we also touch upon a little bit was there. And still we've seen the shipments of these products increasing a lot. So I think that means that uh, even in a difficult situation, we see that the need on the market is, is there. Uh, the fundamentals of the market have not changed. Maybe have been reinforced because there's a need for more um, uh, remote management of objects uh, for more IoT uh, object connected to, to cellular networks. So uh, I would say uh, this, is, uh, this is good for the future. And uh, the technology is there, so I would uh, I would add that uh, it's more about um, wrapping new services, additional services to deliver on the simplicity promise, for instance, uh, that will make the success of an uh, embedded team and uh, that we can consider as being uh, very positive for the future. If I may, I would just like to stress one final point that has not been mentioned, that standardization is crucial for that, and I wouldn't just use say that the GSMA was doing a real good job in the last 10 years in order to achieve a standard products, and that's available for IoT, consumer products. So that's something that sometimes we used to forget, but it's really, really, really important. So thanks, everybody, for participating to this panel. And I want just look to leave the floor to Andrew for the final remarks. Mm -hmm. Thanks again yeah, to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.